So it's time, shall we begin? Okay, welcome to Okayama University Japan SDGs Virtual Global Circuit Academic Seminar. I am Dr. Nobuyuki Kambara, Professor of the Institute of Global Human Resource Development at Okayama University. And I am the host of this seminar. Today's seminar title is Localizing and Partnering for the Sustainable Development Goals, Issues, Issues and Opportunities for an Aging Society. The SDGs are global goals and targets, but what do they mean for local communities? This seminar, taking cases from some of the recent Okayama University research projects, we take a look at mountains, mountains and uh, island communities in Okayama and investigate how communities are changing both in modernizing and post-industrialized societies. Then we, we will examine what the SDGs may mean for these communities and the post-COVID-19 world. Dr. Ken Ao is today's special lecturer. Dr. Ken Ao is a senior assistant professor, graduate school of interdisciplinary sciences and engineering in health systems, Okayama University. He has a mixed background in banking, international development, philanthropy, and research. Now he works for Okayama University as a vice executive director in charge of the university's sustainable development goals related projects and community support programs. He also teaches social innovation, international development, and community development. Before he worked, worked, for, uh, worked six years as a program officer director in Toyota Foundation and Nippon Foundation in charge of their international programs, mainly focused on Southeast Asia. After his presentation, we will start the question and answer period. We will welcome your question by using Zoom chat function. Please select all of panelists and attendees in the drop box of your chat function. This way, everyone will be able to see the questions that are being asked and will understand the context of the answers given. Okay, now uh, welcome Dr. Ken Awo. Please start your presentation. Yes, Professor Kambara, thank you for your kind introduction and also giving me such a great opportunity to share uh, our research to all of you. Uh, since today we're having some uh, small groups, so I'm hoping that I can finish my presentation uh, not so late, and uh, we can move on to Q&A and discussion depending on where your interest is. And while listening to my presentation, I would like to ask you to uh, just type in your question, either as a chat or as a Q&A, whenever you found some uh, question during my presentation, so that I can look back and uh, respond to you uh, after the presentation. Uh, by the way, are all of you hearing me fine? And uh, is my English so far okay? Please let me know if you have any trouble listening to it. Okay, so let us start by sharing the slide. Okay, so as Professor Kambara said, today's topic is localizing and partnering for the SDGs, issues and opportunities for an aging society. And for those of you who are attending today outside from Okayama, uh, these pictures are actually by our 
president of Okayama University, Dr. Makino. So you can see that nearby Okayama, there's a lovely garden and castle, as well as nice field, beautiful village, town, and ocean. So I hope I can share some of the beauty of Okayama during this presentation. So let me start. So as Professor Kambara already uh, shared most of it, let me quickly introduce myself again. So I used to work for a commercial bank, international development NGO, UNDP, and two foundations before coming to Okayama University. Originally born in Tokyo, lived in uh, Los Angeles, Vietnam, Uganda, and the UK. And actually I stayed a lot of uh, days in Southeast Asian countries as a program officer for two foundations. An academic background, international relations, international development, social science. So mostly from social science side. And my current research interest is social innovation in Japan and elsewhere, as well as well-being and the local community studies. And I'm also a vice executive director for planning in charge of the university's SDGs related research projects and community support programs. Oh, and before I start, let me uh, be clear about the disclaimers. Although I use some visuals or slides from Okayama University, all opinions and views are perfectly my own. So it does not represent Okayama University. Let me be clear about this. So today's topic, so first let me share some common challenges that Asia or Asian countries are facing. Second, taking examples from some Okayama University research project, let me share a tale of two communities. Uh, three, then how the SDGs can be localized and used for partnership, reflecting the experience of Okayama University. The first challenges for Asia, Japan as a front runner. So before we start about Asia, so it is so diverse, it is so big, diverse, ethnicity, culture, political system, religion. So it includes China or Singapore, Bangladesh, Turkey, well, anywhere you name it, we're so different. But some of the common culture, as my friend Peter Matanle said, growth at all costs mentality. So economic growth is the most important thing in the world. That is our mentality. And in Asia, uh, we don't have welfare state system where uh, states are responsible for providing basic service as human rights. Most governments prefer giving as some kind of a gift or goodwill for people. So it is different from other developed countries in Europe or um, other Anglophone countries. And there are some tension between government or also business and between social civil society sectors. And in most countries we have rich but often overlooked tradition of social bonds and mutual support, which should be utilized in my own view. And the challenges for Asian societies, well, Many countries are now industrialized, having a lot of manufacturing industry and uh, economic growth. But can we say that we are developed, which 
means that are we happy enough or um, having good conditions for many other things, including but not limited to economic growth? That's a big question. And aging, you can see at this chart, this is the uh, figure showing how many years it took for each country's the percentage of population aged over 65 grew from 7% to 14%. For France, it took more than 100 years. But when it comes to Japan, it's just like 30 something years. And for South Korea, China, Thailand, these countries, you only have less than 30 years before the doubling of this percentage of uh, aged citizens to 40%. So if you can read this Chinese, you can read that this is aging before getting wealthy. So this is a big challenge for many of the Asian countries. And environmental pollution and sustainability is also a big issue, especially when we are trying to achieve economic growth by manufacturing and heavy industry. And in many countries, inequality gaps are widening, not shrinking after the economic growth. So what are the questions that we need to answer? Here are some few. So first we have to imagine what is our vision for a post-industrial society, which is a big challenge because we don't know what that looks like. We just have to imagine it. And that means that we have to think of a good mix of environment, society, economy, and welfare. And also we have to balance between the state and the business and civil society as well as a household or family community to achieve this nice mix. Because we cannot expect one sector, even the state, to provide all the necessary things we need. We have to think how we can collaborate to provide these necessary goods. And finally, relates to all of these questions, we need to find what is our goal after the economic development? I hope you have some idea what that is. So Japan, perhaps it's a front runner, but in a two ways meaning. First, it was a, a front runner to succeed the develop, economic development, so success as a developing countries starting from the late 19th century until 1980s. So we were good at export oriented industrialization starting from this light industry. Then as most of you know, we moved to electronics, cars, those heavy industries and performed quite well However, after the 1980s, we're in a long stagnation. And also, we are a front runner of aging society. So now we are almost 30% of the population is over 65 years old. And the population, as you can see, uh, it continued growing in the modern era. And we reached over 120 million people in 2008, but now we're already in falling stage. So by year 2100, probably we will drop by 40 million. So it's one third of the maximum year. So we're going back to like 200 years ago population. So that is a big challenge for us. 
And it is quite reasonable that we should not aim for industrialization when the population is shrinking so quickly. However, there is a continuing attachment to the golden age of our economic growth for manufacturing. So we're still not being able to find the alternative of it. That is a big problem, according to my opinion. So the question for us Japanese is, what are the lessons that we can share with our neighbors as a front runner, both for economic growth and for aging? I think that is a big question for us. And how do the SDGs link with this? So just to make sure that we're on the same page, the sustainable development goals are 17 goals, 169 targets, 230 something indicators, which to be achieved by 2030. And they were adopted in 2015 UN Sustainable Development Summit. And the important thing is that they are universal goals, not only for developing countries, but also for developed countries like Japan. And this is the phrase, leave no one behind. Everyone is in included. And why we had to set this kind of ambitious goal is because we are facing the major risks of global climate change or catastrophe and also inequality gap. So it is not something that we can achieve by doing as business as usual, but as the slogan of the SDG says, we need to transform our world to make our society more sustainable. So I'm not sure whether we have anyone from Thailand here, but uh, here we're sharing the recent results of the SDGs based on this Sustainable Development Report 2020. So you can see that both Thailand and Japan are having a lot of challenges to achieve the SDGs by year 2030. So some of the reds are major challenges and these downfall arrows are even decreasing or worsening trends in some of the goals. For Thailand, it is like education, partnerships for goal. For Japan, it is inequality. So you can see that we have a lot of challenges ahead. So not only Thailand and Japan, but I think most of our countries need to think seriously how we can achieve our sustainable future. So that was about the challenge for Asian countries and the SDGs. And now I want to turn to a tale of two communities from two Okayama University research projects. So again, I'm not sure how many of you have had a chance to visit Okayama, but it's here in Western Japan, uh, facing this inland sea. And actually we have some city or urban industrial areas, but we also have many small historical towns, mountainous and island areas, which are very beautiful in any seasons you can visit us. However, in these communities, many of them are suffering from aging, population decrease, and deindustrialization, especially in rural areas. But one thing I want to emphasize is the richness in its history that many people worked hard to tackle with different social issues 
uh, to different stages in history. So even in the pre-modern era, when samurai was ruling Japan, usually schools, public schools were only for those samurais or the aristocrats. However, in Okayama, one lordship built a school which can uh, accept commoners who are willing to study. And another lordship also had a tradition of doctors studying Western uh, science when it was even banned by the government. And in the modern era, Okayama became a rich uh, area thanks to the cotton industry. And one family in Kurashiki, a beautiful city in Okayama, uh, used that wealth to support uh, peasant issues or uh, research on social issues or labor issues and set up many research institutes, which some of them are now a part of our university. And this was a very progressive thing because that was a time when emperor was ruling Japan and these labor issues and social issues were thought as some kind of a leftist activities. And, but these people were courageous enough to do some attempt. And after the war, Okayama University was built based on this heritage. And we had some major problem with environmental pollution at the sea, which now is a beautiful sea, overcame with these issues. And the story I'm going to talk later is the story of Fukutake family and Venice Corporation's revival of Setouchi Islands through contemporary art. And my first story is about this mountainous village called O Village. So as you can see, this village is within a mountain and uh, it was a rich village like 100 years ago because of this mountain, they can produce charcoal and timber and sell to the lowland area, which they needed for the energy source that day or to build houses simply. So this photo is roughly 70 years ago. This village had 250 people and there was a school, elementary school with 80 students. So it was actually a quite lively village. And you can see the people. And this uh, lady is, I think she is um, getting the uh, texture from a kind of wood to produce traditional paper, washi paper. And this is a local festival with some lion dance. Again, this is 70 years ago. They had many child, children that time. So that time, Okayama University research team went in and uh, conducted an interdisciplinary holistic community research of the village. And these records became the very precious data to show the village livelihood before the industrialization. And now our research team is revisiting this village since two years ago. So this is some recent photos. And we're trying to see how the village changed in this 70 years time and to together think of their future. So we want to see how the village well-being can be sustained through economy or industry and social life of community and health. So some of the findings. Now the population shrank less than 50 people. So it's like one fifth of what they had in 70 years ago. 
and the majority, more than 50%, are aged 60, uh, over 65 years old. And many people have left the village. So of course, no school, no shop left here. They have just like a couple of children. And uh, surprisingly, because they have a very good road along this village, so most people can commute to nearby towns. So they work as farmers only in the weekend. So they are not full-time farmers anymore. It's like weekend farmers. And they have another full-time job as an office worker or factory workers. That's how they sustain this village. Otherwise, I'm sure this village disappeared long ago. But still, we can see some abandoned houses when people left to urban areas and never came back. And some of the farmland are already deserted because there's no one to cultivate that land. And sometimes they are too old to do that hard work. And the forest is same. And 70 years ago, they had many communal support system like village credit system or some kind of gathering just to have fun or drink or travel together. But many of these communal support systems were gone in 70 years time. Uh, however, we can still see that they are trying to sustain their tradition as these village festivals and rituals, still in a simplified way. So you can see this. This is a portable shrine that before men were carrying this on their shoulders. It took like uh, 20 young men to carry this, but now there are no, not enough young men in this village, so they just have to carry it by machines. And many things are simplified, including these uh, feast for gods or some traditional ceremonies. But still they are maintaining it because they feel that this is a rare opportunity to gather as a village. So it is functioning as some kind of communal bond or social capital still. And this gentleman is one of our key um, informant. And actually I was checking some old photos for this presentation and found him 70 years ago. And it still resembles him now, right? So he was from, uh, um, village headman family, so very important person in this area. And that's why he couldn't leave this area when he graduated his high school. He said, he told me that all of his classmates except him left the village and moved to urban area, but he couldn't move because his father was already dead. So he was the a master of the household, so people didn't let him go. And uh, when he was talking about that memory, he just cried and said, I also wanted to leave, I wanted to go. That was, I don't know, 60 years ago, perhaps. So that was the time. But he stayed and uh, did many works, including village chief or the head of the agricultural cooperatives. So he was actually helping other villagers to maintain farmlands, forests, and communal activities. So he's a very uh, well-known and respected person. And he knows a lot of stories about the 70 years time. And uh, we became close friends in this two years. And uh, recently he asked us, Professor, 
can can you think what can we do to sustain this these villages not only ours but there are many villages similar to ours and how can we sustain these communities why can't you think together with us that was his request and i think it is a very very heavy question for us uh, however it is also uh, worth knowing that there are some innovations already happening in this area this is a communal agricultural company called, called farm tomi it was set up by a village and uh, local farmers so this company is uh, borrowing lands from those who are already very old and who cannot cultivate their lands anymore and to continue cultivating paddy rice fields although it is not a very profitable thing to do but at least they are helping to maintain the um, community farmlands and this is another company which is actually an agricultural cooperative set up by local people and they changed the paddy rice field into fruit orchard like a grape peach pears which is uh, more profitable than uh, paddy rice and they are selling their nice products directly to consumers in urban areas and they also have their own cafe and selling nice sweets and employing local women and also some young people coming from outside areas who want to live in this kind of rural uh, villages i think this is a very good encouraging example and this is a a local timber company called in the show forestry and they are doing a lot to upgrade their product and it's also impressive the one thing i was very surprised was that they started buying forest lands from local villagers because they found that now villagers are becoming old or when they died they have no one to inherit and maintain the forest so they decided to buy these forests and to cut and replant the forest by themselves to maintain the uh, local forest. And they're using this crowdfunding uh, scheme to raise funding for so, such activities. And finally, this is another timber company called Macon Lamwood. Uh, they are developing wooden biomass plant so that local people and uh, cooperatives can bring the forest products to this biomass plant and sell it as a energy source. And this biomass plant can sell energy and raise income for local community. And they also developed another upgraded product called uh, cross laminated timber or CLT to be utilized to build this kind of big wooden architecture. So there are a lot happening even in this kind of mountainous area. So that was the first case. And the second case is about these islands in so called Tetochi Inland Sea. Tetochi Inland Sea is between these prefectures and it is really a beautiful area. The first national park in Japan. And it also has a lot of uh, cultural heritage like Himeji Castle, Hiroshima, Itsukushima Shrine and others. So definitely this is one place you should visit if you have a chance to visit this area. 
However, these islands suffered a lot, uh, especially in modern time. So because these islands were uh, useful places, especially for metal refinery. So there was a lot of refineries set up in these islands and uh, terrible pollution and contaminations happened by these refineries, as you can see. And later, just like 50 years ago, there was a company who dumped thousands of tons of uh, hazardous waste in one of these islands. And the islanders had to struggle, not only with that company, but also with government authorities who were kind of ignoring that problem. It was a very hard struggle for them. And even after those problems were solved, these islands also had to suffer by severe aging and depopulation because people were moving out of these islands. And what happened here in one of these islands called Naoshima? So this gentleman, Mr. Soichiro Fukutake, is a local business person and also a philanthropist. And he worked in, uh, actually he's the owner of this com company, education company called Benese Corporation. And uh, Almost by accident, he got a lot, large chunk of land in this Naoshima and decided to revive this beautiful island by contemporary art. So he first started from building this contemporary art museum in Naoshima, which is also a hotel and you can stay in this kind of contemporary art. And later, uh, Naoshima communities or villages ask him to help to maintain this kind of old architecture. Um, and he decided also to utilize contemporary art. So you can see one of these old houses. It looks just like an old house, but inside, this is how it looks like when you go inside. So there's a digital clocks beneath the water. And this is actually a contemporary art. And this is a local shrine also renovated by contemporary art, including this glass made stairs. And this one is a public bath and you can see how it is decorated uh, quite strangely for a Japanese public bath. And he also built another uh, art museum called uh, Chichu Art Museum, which is built actually underneath the ground. And this is another very nice museum to visit. And it expanded to a couple of other islands, including Teshima, so this is Teshima Museum, and this is my favorite one. And another island, Inujima, they utilize this uh, refinery to be rebuilt as a museum, as well as utilizing these community houses. And since 2010, they have a uh, contemporary art festival every three years. So the next one in 2022 called Seto Uchi Triennale. And here it was expanded to whole of Setona, Seto Uchi Inland Sea. And the art artists visited these islands and build art in or together with uh, community people. So it was like a communal festival and people utilize their nice food and cultural heritage and other resources to welcome these visitors. So it became a very popular international tourist destination. 
And as a result, so in last Satoshi Tree and Nale 2019, over 1 million people visited there. And now Satoshi and especially Naoshima Island is listed as top destination for international tourists. And uh, even international visitors participated as volunteers, especially during the Setochi Triennale. And there are many young newcomers coming into these islands because they just want to live and work there, which is a very surprising thing. And what Mr. Fukutake calls as Naoshima method is Actually, he says that his goal is to see the elderly uh, laughing and smiling in their own community. So he says that art and architecture is not the goal. It is just the medium to connect rural elderly and urban youth. And then these rural elderly can guide the visitors about these art products and the island and its history and culture. This is what he calls as the Naoshima method. And another thing is to uh, build this kind of community. He says that we should not scrap and build. So destroy the old thing and build a new thing. That is the wrong way, he says. Instead, he says, use what exists to create what is to be. So to create an um, ideal future, we need to utilize what's already there. That is his method. And he says that economy must serve culture. So what he calls public benefit capitalism is that the private company uh, Benesse will make profit and then it will benefit the community through these foundations and the uh, families. So this is what he calls public benefit capitalism. The profit should be utilized for public good. And interestingly, this Naoshima method attracts many uh, attention from international viewers, especially from China. So he is now invited to China to utilize this method for rural regeneration in Shandong uh, province. So those were two very different stories from two communities. I don't know which you liked, but uh, for me, both of them are very important places because I'm personally involved in both of these research. And finally, let me wrap up by sharing how SDGs can be localized and used for partnerships. So from those two very different cases, some lessons, actually there should be many lessons to be learned, but if I can just say one important thing. So before talking about the solutions, we need to understand the local community's history, context, resources, people, endeavor, and hope and will. So we need to understand them before thinking about the solution. And if I can rephrase it, of course, SDGs are global goals. However, for each community, they have their own or unique natural environment and history, culture, and local resources, including their people and what they have already tried. And they also have their own local issues. So this is to say, the current status of local community. And there's also a future vision 
which is imagined by the people in the local community, not by the ex outsiders. And I believe that the SDGs can be utilized to connect the gap between the future vision and the current situation for any local communities. So this is how we can localize the SDGs. So based on their current situation and their future vision, we can utilize the SDGs. And to achieve such change and uh, to face the serious challenges, we need to have various innovations, technology, business, and social innovations. And there are, there's no one organization or no one sector which can create such societal change, including government, business, civil society, or academic institutions. So that's why we need to create the space or ecosystem to enable or create this kind of innovation together. And the role for the ac academic institution, we of course have the role to produce knowledge or to educate people who can contribute for this kind of innovation. But from our experience, we are kind of having a feeling that maybe academic institution can also act as some kind of honest broker within these collaborations. And what we are heading for, this is again my personal opinion. I think now we should think not only of economic growth, but we should care more about holistic well being. So already there are many institutions thinking about this, including this OECD well being index. So I just revised it to make it easy. So of course we need to think about income and job or housing. But we also need to think about environment, health, community, culture and sports, education, subjective happiness, safety and freedom, many other, including now and future. And then we can achieve a personal or communal well-being. And our economy or industry is shifting from manufacturing to knowledge-based products and services, of course. And we also need to know that well-being is different between different communities. So we can easily understand this. If we think of big city like Tokyo or Kuala Lumpur or Bangkok, Shanghai, London, New York. And if we think of well-being in small villages in mountainous or island community, if we compare these well-beings with same measures, it doesn't work simply. So we should think of what are the diverse and unique well-being for different communities. And also, when we think of Japan and other Asian countries, we should have more mutual empathy. Although we are different, but we shouldn't stop our communication there. Oh, we're different, so, so what? We should try to understand our difference and also to learn from what others are doing well or what others have and we do not. So this is one example. So I had a chance to work with aging issues in Thailand before. And that time I worked with Professor Warawet Swanrada in Chulalongkorn uh, University and uh, he was sharing to me about the community-based elderly care system in Thailand and even the spiritual well-being for elderly people in Thailand. And I thought we have a lot to learn from these practices in Thailand. 
And I'm sure there are many that I can learn, we can learn from other countries, as well as what other countries can learn from us. So that is my hope. And finally, SDGs can be utilized also to work with these local stakeholders. So we can broaden our partnership, not only with government and businesses, but we can work with nonprofit organizations, local communities, local schools, when we use the SDGs as commun uh, common language. And SDGs can also be utilized uh, for international exchange and sharing, which we have with the US State Department, University of Michigan, Leiden University, and Tamasat University. Actually, this is a photo when I visited Tamasat University and uh, we had a, a class together. So thank you very much for your attention and I hope you found something useful in my presentation. And please let me know if you have any question. So let me stop my presentation here. Thank you very much again. Mm. Any more question? All right. Uh, I think uh, we are about to finish uh, today's webinar. Um, I would like to give my sincere uh, thanks to uh, Dr. Ao uh, for sharing your expert knowledge and opinions. And uh, I would also like to thank all the audience members for their attendance and contribution to the, 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 this discussion. And um, this uh, 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 Okaima University uh, uh, Japan SDG, SDGs Global Circuit Seminar will continue. So I, I'd like to see, see you again uh, very soon. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Ao. Uh, and everybody, uh, thank you very much. Uh, see you again. Yeah, thank you everyone for lively discussion. And thank you very much, Professor Kambara and uh, colleagues for preparing for this. I uh, hope you guys have a nice weekend and hope we will see each other in near future. Thank you and bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.